All right, so our engagement today, I think this is our, this is our fifth lecture. Do you see my screen, Owen? Yes, I can. Okay, and after all, I'm not moving any slides. So today we are going to be reflecting on the feasibility of a global ethics or a global ethic, so to say, uh, the challenge of, of, of religion or the role of religions. And uh, it would seem that it is a great idea to have something or sort of an ethical consensus, you know, uh, an agreement on particular values, on criteria, on attitudes as the basis of the world society that is coming into being progressively. But there are people who think that this is just an illusion. Since there are so many differences which have always existed between nations, there are so many differences that have always existed among cultures, there are so many uh, differences that have existed among religions. How then can we be advancing a global ethic? And in view of the current tendencies and trends towards what we would call cultural, uh, linguistic, and religious self-assertions, you know, everyone is claiming their space in the cultural context, in the linguistic context, and in the religious uh, context. Also, mainly because of the view that there is a widespread cultural naturalism, I mean, cultural uh, nationalism, also due to the fact that there is quite an aggressive linguistic chauvinism and religious fundamentalism. So in the context of these variations and realities, one would wonder whether an ethical consensus leading us to a global ethic is possible. But it can be argued on the reverse that it is precisely in view of these hegemonic chauvinisms and fundamentalisms that a basic ethical consensus is necessary. One of the key, you know, there are several key arguments against the idea of the globe, of the global ethic And according to Hans Kuhn, who has been debating this quite a bit, he provides several responses to the arguments against a global ethic. The first argument is, we live in a world and a time in which we can observe new dangerous tensions and polarizations between believers and non-believers. Church members and those who have been secularized, the clerical and the anti-clerical. How then can you talk about a global ethic in a world or in a globe such as that one. Now Hans Kuhn responds that there will be no survival of democracy without a coalition of believers and non-believers in mutual respect. 
The second argument that challenges the feasibility of a global ethic proceeds thus. They would argue that we live in a world and a time in which humankind is threatened by the clash of civilization. And this clash of civilization was advanced by Samuel Huntington. I think some of you in international relations is one of the guys you could have read. For example, we have the clash between the Muslim civilization and Islamic civilization and the Confucian uh, civilization. We could have a clash between the Confucian uh, civilization and the Western civilization. Hans Kung rebuts this reasoning, saying that there will be no peace between civilizations without a peace between the religions. And there will be no peace between the religions without a dialogue between religions. Yet it is the case that a number of people would actually object. In the sense that they would ask whether there are not so many dogmatic differences and obstacles between the religions which make a real dialogue quite naive and illusion. So there is a possibility that what we are talking about as a global ethics has been put to question by a number of people who would call it an illusion. Okay. The third argument that seems to cast doubt on the idea of a global ethic would go in this sense. They would advance that we live in a world and a time when better relations between, when better relations between the religions are often blocked, well, often blocked by all sorts of dogmatisms. A dogma is a, is a, is a deep fundamental teaching of a religion. So we live in a world that is blocked, you know, that the religions and their dialogue is blocked by deep dogmatisms, which can be found not only in the mainstream churches, but in several other churches and religions. Also modern ideologies have some kind of dogmatism in them. Okay, so this is the third argument. How can you talk of a glo global ethic when the world in which we live has these radical religious thoughts, these radical churches, mosques, and uh, even radical modern ideologies. In the last two classes, we mentioned a few of those radical modern ideologies. How can we then talk about a global ethic? Now, Hans Kung responds to this by saying that there will be no new world order without a new world ethic. And that this world ethic has to be global in character, has to be planetary, 
even though there are dogmatic differences. So Hans Kung has argued that in the positive sense, a global ethic is one other than the necessary minimum, is the necessary minimum of common human values, criteria, and basic attitudes. The global ethics is the necessary minimum of common human values, criteria, and basic attitudes. It would essentially be a basic consensus. It would be a basic consensus on building values, I mean, on binding values, a basic consensus on binding values, irrevocable criteria, and basic attitudes, which are affirmed by all religions, despite their dogmatic differences affirmed by all religions despite their dogmatic differences and that this basic consensus of values criteria and attitudes can indeed also be contributed by non-believers How then can we talk of a consensus? How can we agree on universal ethical standards? It is certain that even science and technology cannot grant us this global consensus because science and technology actually needs this consensus. The great technological and economic problems of our time have also become political and moral problems. such that you cannot limit the decision over how to build consensus to the area of psychology, sociology, political theory, or even philosophy in their exclusion. It has to be multidisciplinary. We actually have philosophers who think that a basic global consensus on ethical questions is impossible. In their argument, this question of ethics is only regional. So they would posit what we would call regional ethics, so to say. So such philosophers are well protected usually in their academic environment and its regional environment. They will then leave aside the globe with all the challenges we have that just posit the view that ethics is regional. So we have philosophers who are opposed to the idea of a global ethics. Yet there are other philosophers who would defend 
who would defend a radical pluralism. And this is in the postmodern fashion or thought, a radical pluralism. We also have a third group of philosophers who would say that perhaps there is something that is held in common. Perhaps there is something that is held in common and deserves to be brought to light. Something like universal ethical standards even among human beings of different nations, cultures, and religions. Now, the concept of standards these days means something that is accepted as a model, something that is conventional, something that has been agreed upon and by which other things are also oriented, or they are to be measured. Standards are like criterion, they are norms. And when we say ethical standards, we would be talking of moral values, moral norms, and moral attitudes. That we use the word ethic, global ethic, to denote the basic moral attitude of an individual or a group. While on the other hand, ethics would mean the philosophical or say theological theory of moral values. Okay, ethics is the philosophical or theological theory of moral values, norms, and attitudes. But ethic is used to connote or denote the basic moral attitude of an individual. Okay, thinking globally and acting locally within thyself. Now, ethics, on the other hand, is the philosophical and theological theory of moral values, norms, and attitudes. Often, though the distinction is not drawn so clearly. The differences in the society, world society, are so great. And these differences are not only between the nations, cultures, and religions, but also between the forms of life. There are differences in scientific views. There are differences in economic systems. There are differences in social models and communities of faith themselves have differences in between them. And it would be inconceivable to obtain complete agreement. So it becomes difficult to talk of a total ethical consensus. However, varied and complex, however varied and complex as the national, cultural, and religious differences might be, they all concern themselves with the issue of the human person. 
And in our day and time, in particular, through modern systems of communication, radio, television, or the internet, etc., the human person's experience is that of increasingly a community, a community with a common destiny. And this is where the question arises whether due to these antecedents, there cannot or should not be a minimum set of values, criteria, and attitudes that would be common to all human persons Isn't it possible, so to say, to obtain minimum ethical consensus? Then with all our differences and all our diversities, there is always the question of truth and justice. These concepts of truth and justice are universal. We may have different perspectives about justice, but the issue of justice is universal. We may try to relativize the truth, but the idea of what truth is, is always universal. Nowadays, if we had to start from fact and not theory, nowadays the whole world is indignant about particular local events. When people are driven onto the street in a demonstration, whether it is in Thailand, Taiwan, Egypt, Khartoum, Kampala, or Nairobi. This is a broadcast on television the world over. The demonstrations born out of the George Floyd killing, the Black Lives Matter demonstration, even though some have become violent, are already in our living rooms. And a number of us would wish to identify ourselves with what is going on. The anger that you feel when you watch the clip of someone kneeling on the neck of another makes you think, what if you are actually on the spot where it is happening? So you get drawn into that environment because of the universality of the principle of justice, the principle of truth. Any injustice anywhere seems to be speaking to those who are justice-minded. It has so happened that people globally have joined into global movements for justice and peace, global movements to challenge injustice. By the click of a button on one's phone, they sign a petition to challenge this minister, to challenge that parliament, to challenge this senator for doing any action that is considered to be leading to injustice. So truth and justice are universal. There was a professor 
of social sciences in the 1980s called Michael Walzer, who published an important book in the defense of pluralism and equality. He called it spheres of justice. He investigated this phenomenon in connection with what is held in common ethically, the phenomenon of universal responses to justice in relation to what is held in common ethically. In his other book, Thick and Thin, Michael Walzer points out that in particular, a universal element can be detected in the perception of political conflicts. in the perception of political conflict. When in 1989, the Berlin Wall was coming down in Europe, people marched through the streets of Prague, they carried signs, some had the label truth, and others had the label justice. So television viewers across the globe were seeing this huge movement of truth and justice. It didn't matter which nation, which culture, which religion. There was some sort of spontaneous understanding what global values and criteria were being required locally to challenge the communist dictatorship there. Okay, when you see the posters, Black Lives Matter, immediately it clicks to the thought of the rampant deaths and then the young people in the ghetto in Nairobi, the social justice movements would then say in Kenya that all lives matter, even the Kenyan lives matter, that the police has been brutalizing since COVID-19 started. So that tends to be a connection of values that even though we have this diversity of race, religion, color, and doctrine or creed, there are usually standards that are universal, truth, justice being one of them. Again, to draw on the example of Prague at the collapse of the Soviet Union, the idea of truth comes out amongst these citizens. They were not marching in defense of the coherence theory or the consensus theory or the correspondence theory of truth. Okay, I mean, these, these are like epistemological connotations. What is truth? Truth is when what is is coherent in itself or what is agrees what is out there, or what we know corresponds with reality. Okay, that's the coherence, consensus, and correspondence theories of truth. The demonstrators, the Monainchi, the Wanjiku, does not go out there to defend these theories of truth. They go out there to defend truth. 
So perhaps they could disagree about such theories amongst themselves. More likely, these demonstrators, they would not even care about these differences. Now, if you know that the demonstrations going on in the United States on the question of Black Lives Matter spread across the 50 states, it also the case that we had such demonstrations in Europe and elsewhere. Now, even if we may disagree on the manner in which Black Lives Matter is proceeding, even when we must disagree that the Black Lives Matter revolution has been hijacked by a more violent leftist group, the principle remains that the truth of slavery, the truth of long-term discrimination exists. And it demands that, that truth be aired, challenged, and a pursuit of justice again, the universal value sets in. Now, these citizens of Prague in 1989 were not marching in defense of the utilitarian equality of John Rawls' difference. John Rawls, another theoretician on justice, justice and right. Okay. They were not demonstrating for any of these philosophical theories of desert or merit or entitlement. But with the word justice on their placards, these demonstrators were demanding quite simply an end to arbitrary arrests, equal and impartial law enforcement, the abolition of the privileges and prerogatives of the party elites, etc. So it would seem that when someone puts the word justice up there, it speaks to everyone. It could speak differently to everyone, but it does speak to everyone. That when you put the word truth out there, it would speak differently to several people, but indeed it speaks to everyone. So it is important to examine this question of ethical consensus for, for two reasons. One is that a global consensus is possible in respect of elementary morality. And elementary morality, usually also called thin morality, limits itself to some fundamental demands. And it is only such thin morality that can also be expected of other nations, cultures, and religions and promoted, so to say, worldwide. And this is the idea of a pure morality that cannot be easily uh, given up. Consensus will not be necessarily given up where we have culturally differentiated 
morality. And this, this, this differentiated morality would necessarily contain numerous specific cultural elements, the particular forms of democracy or even pedagogy for learning purposes in these disputed concrete situations such as abortion, euthanasia, there will be no unifying demand. And no kind of demand expects to be made on other nations, cultures, or religions to have the same moral practice. So universally, there is agreement, particularly there is variation. But because we say that regardless of our diversities, we all deal with the human person. So the idea of humanity and the golden rule comes into play. Because morality is always basically concrete, it does not need to exist in an abstract universality, but in a local or particular situation. Somewhere between minimalism and maximalism, somewhere in between the thick and the thin moralities, somewhere between those who think in a universalist manner and those who think in a relativistic manner. Dualism exists, but the human person still reigns. So the golden rule of do unto others what you would have them do to you that seems to exist in so many traditions and cultural formulations cannot be ignored as a basis of a global ethic. And this principle would guide those who are taking decisions, whether as secretaries of state, as cabinet secretaries in charge of foreign affairs, UN diplomats, representatives of the permanent missions. This golden rule of humanity can be found in all the great religious and ethical traditions. We will try and list some of them. Confucius, Chinese legend and philosopher who lived between 551 to 400 89 BCE, 551 to 489 BCE. Confucius used the words, open quote, what you yourself do not want, do not do to another person could find that in a text called Analytics, Analects 15.23. The Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, who lived between 60 BCE 
to turn a D or CE, used the words, do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. The document is Shabbat number 31A. Jesus of Nazareth in Matthew 7, 12 and Luke 6, 31 uses the words, whatever you want people to do to you, do also to them. In Islam, the 40th hadith of Ar Nawawi, number 13. None of you is a believer as long as he does not wish his brother what he wishes himself. The Socratic uh, Tikanga of the Jainists in Jainism, they use the words, human beings should be indifferent to worldly things and treat all creatures in the world as they would want to be treated themselves. The Jainist Sutra Kritanga, Volume 1, Numbers 11 and 33. The Samyutta Nikaya of the Buddhists, Volume 5, states that a state which is not pleasant or enjoyable for me will also not be for him. And how can I impose on another a state which is not pleasant or enjoyable for me? The Hindu Mahabharata Volume 13 uses the words in Hinduism, one should not behave towards others in a way which is unpleasant for oneself. That is the essence of morality. Even philosophers such as Kant, Immanuel Kant, held the position that act so that your act may become universal law. Meaning when you do whatever you're doing, think, assuming it was the universal, the universally accepted conduct for everyone, would you enjoy living in that world? So we realize that the great traditions of humankind know very many much more concrete maxims that can be demonstrated. So the structural and institutional problems in modern society are the ones to be challenged for proceeding counter to this human tradition. People would ask, why do you have to talk so much about morality? Don't we always have laws? Don't we live in a constitutional state? And hasn't the international community of states already created numerous transnational 
transcultural and trans-religious structures of law, why should we be talking about morality? The deficiency of human responsibility necessitates it. For we talk not only of rights in the global dispensation, but also responsibility. In 1789, those who are familiar with European history, we had Liberté, Fraternité, Liberté declaration by the French revolutionaries. And that's the demand they put on the table. But it would be necessary that a declaration of the rights of man is accompanied by a declaration on the responsibilities of man. Otherwise, in the end, all human beings would have only things which they would want to play off against others. And no one would any longer recognize the responsibilities without which the rights cannot function. So human beings have rights and responsibilities and they both, both rights and responsibilities exist from the beginning. We have so many groups of individuals today that appeal to rights against others without recognizing any responsibilities of their own. Responsibility, obligation, duty are usually misused. Duty towards those in authority, duty towards the people, duty towards the party, duty towards your church, has been used in a totalitarian manner to drum and condition people. authoritarian and hierarchical ideologies have been coined to push duty into the minds of everyone with the words duty is duty, an order is an order, amri ni amri, And yet, if we are to think of the global ethic, people ought to be obligated, not obliged. Blind obedience, whether in the state or church, is technically immoral. You cannot obey at the pain of sin. You remember when I pointed out the situation of the Nazi Holocaust and the subsequent Nuremberg trials, where the question at the center was, how do you prosecute? judge, convict, and sentence a man who is accused of doing an evil act, yet what they did 
was allowable within their law. So it is in this context of blind obedience to the state or the church that we discover how much harm we, we do to ourselves. So then, we need to know that not all responsibilities follow from rights. We could use probably three examples to demonstrate this. I mean, we're dealing with the relationship between rights and responsibilities. A special example, the freedom of the press enjoyed by a newspaper or a journalist would be guaranteed and protected by the modern constitutional state. So when you check the Bill of Rights of many of our constitutions, you would find the freedom of the press in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's Article 19. In the ICCPR Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, I think it's also Article 19. Then you come down to our various constitutions, you will find the Bill of Rights protects the freedom of the press. Okay? So the freedom of the press is enjoyed by this newspaper or journalist. And it is also protected by the Constitution. The journalist, however, has a right to report freely. The law may not only attack this right, meaning the constitution will not allow the law to attack this right to report freely, but on the contrary, the law must protect this right actively and if need be, the law should even establish it with its authority. In this case then, the state, the citizen, have the responsibility to respect the right of this newspaper or this journalist to report freely. On the other hand, however, this right does not in any way affect the responsibility of the journalist or the newspaper itself. Namely, to report objectively and fairly not to caricature reality and not to manipulate the public, but to inform it truthfully. It's 12 hours. So the freedom of press and the rights associated to the press do not necessarily yield into the responsibility to be this objective and avoid caricaturing the truth. The second demonstration is a more general example. For example, the right of each individual to property is guaranteed by many constitutions. It contains the legal obligation for others, including the state and individual citizens, to respect this property and not to misappropriate it. Actually, for the state, it has a duty to respect, to protect, and to fulfill. Respecting meaning the state cannot interfere with property rights. Protect meaning the state has a duty to prevent others from interfering with property rights. And to fulfill, the state has a duty actually to make sure 
that individuals can acquire property in a secure manner. However, this right, the right of each individual to property, does not in any way affect the responsibility of the property owner himself. That would be the responsibility to use the property in a manner that is antisocial, meaning these right to hold property do not expressly prevent the property owner from using his property in an antisocial way. Neither does it place obligation over this property owner to use the land socially. It does not in any way affect the responsibility of the property owner to restrain the unquenchable human greed for money as they use their property, greed for consumption, greed for prestige, and to develop some sense of proportion and moderation. So we have right to buy property, we have whatever, but globally just imagine, until recently, if it had not been for the coronavirus, where a lot of travel and industries slowed down, the global warming would continue to grow. And do you know who is affected by global warming or the climate change situation? We have largely the Icelanders and the Greenlanders because their land is melting. The fresh water that covers their land in the form of ice is melting and getting into the oceans. And when it gets into the oceans, sea levels rise. When sea levels rise, the ocean currents change. When ocean currents change, the result is rain patterns and weather patterns are distorted, then famines, then droughts, and that whole entire connection. But who is polluting? It is not the Icelanders or the Greenlanders running the polluting industries. No, the industries are out in Vietnam, they're out in China, they're out in India. But the Chinese and Indians are producing for which market? For their market, but also for the African market. So I, in my right to own property and hold the property, goes ahead and purchases. But the responsibility to buy critically and to consume critically or invest ethically is rarely imposed by my right to hold uh, property. And the entire cycle continues that by your consumption right here in Nairobi, you impact on the production process in China. And the production process in China, if it is not clean, would affect the global climate balance. We are talking global ethics. The third demonstration of where uh, responsibilities fail to flow from rights would be a general example. The freedom of any individual to decide in accordance with his or her own conscience entails the legal obligation that others, meaning individual and state, should respect a free decision of conscience. The individual conscience is guaranteed protection by many constitutions. I hope you're aware that uh, in the recently floated Senate Bill number 23 of 2019 by Senator Susan Kihiha called the Reproductive Health Care Bill, there are provisions that seem to impose it on health care providers to either carry out a termination of pregnancy all compulsorily refer, all compulsorily refer the client to another provider who is not a conscientious objector to termination of pregnancy. 
So yes, the right is sometimes not protected. The duty to protect life may not be protected. The conscience and its exercise may not be protected. Sometimes overtly attacked and challenged. However, this freedom of conscience is by no means entailing the ethical responsibilities of the individuals themselves in every instance to follow their own consciences, even indeed especially when this is unpleasant or abhorrent of them. Can we then say that rights are without morals? The distinction between legal and ethical obligations is important for a more precise distinction between the levels of law and ethics. In particular, for the implementation of human rights. First of all, we need to clarify the question, can one develop an ethic valid for the whole of humankind simply on the basis of human rights? I'll rephrase that again. Can one develop an ethic valid for the whole of humankind simply on the basis of human rights? The levels of law and ethics are related in many ways. The origin as well as the presence and application of the law already presupposes a legal ethic. On the other hand, however, ethics is not exhausted in the law. The levels of law and ethic are thus to be distinguished in principle. The levels of law and ethic are thus to be distinguished in principle. And this is of particular significance for the question of human rights. Human beings have fundamental rights which are formulated in declarations of human rights. And these, we could say, there is a correspondence with responsibilities, both of the state and other individual citizens to respect, protect, and fulfill these rights. These are legal obligations. And at this point, we would be at the level of law, the laws, regulations, the enforcers, judiciary, and police. But at the same time, human beings have elementary responsibilities, which are already given with the personhood and are not based on any laws. There are ethical obligations which are not fixed in the law. And here 
we would be at the level of ethics, at the level of customs, the conscience, and the heart. I don't know if you have seen this advert that has been going around, see this tomato, see this orange, see this, uh, this uh, mango. I think the ladies, uh, Susan Kahumbo, then we have uh, uh, John Allen Namo, then we have uh, Nerima Wako, these, these, these young, young celebrities and researchers and journalists that are trying to make a case against toxic chemicals being imported into the country. I debate arose on another platform uh, on which I am that look here, can such a campaign suffice unless the consumers begin to make a conscious decision not to consume products that are likely to be tainted with, but, uh, with, uh, with toxic chemicals. Now, in economics, the customer is king. You have a right to acquire property for sure. You have a right to food so you can buy food. But the silent and written responsibility is for you to know that when you choose to buy, your act of buying is more than an economic act. That your act of buying is a moral act. By buying an item off a supermarket shelf, you are voting for its further and better production. So if this particular item you are buying pollutes its way to the country, you're saying produce more polluting items. If this item you're buying off the shelf is produced by a company that pays its laborers poorly or employs children denying them an opportunity to go to school, when you buy this item, you are funding the further production of an item that is exploiting labor. Okay, so when we talk about a global ethic, and this is an ethic at the individual level, which would then cumulatively have a global influence, we are talking about many of these unwritten, unfixed legal principles that are not fixed in law, but they are binding on us. And because we are human persons with a conscience, and the human conscience is that inner voice that is with you to make you aware of what is good and what is evil. It is with you as you are about to do. It is with you as you do. And it is with you after you've done to confer on you some sort of happiness if you've done good and a sort of a guilt uh, when you have not done. And of course, it accrues out of knowledge of what is good and evil. So the question, the distinction between law and ethic has momentous consequences. Because law and ethic are not a priori identical, but can fall apart. The law very often does not function. And that is particularly true of politics. If one or both partners in a treaty do not have a priori the ethical will to execute it, or even to observe a ceasefire if it is a situation of war, law will not work. Actually, law is only law because people obey it. As soon as people withdraw obedience to a law, it collapses. Law survives on an ethical population that chooses to obey that chooses to surrender. They could have been coerced or compelled for fear of sanctions or whatever, 
But as soon as people withdraw obedience to a law, it collapses. On the level of international law, in 1955, Max Huber pointed out the relevance of the distinction between law and ethic. In his reflection, Huber, who was not only a renowned Swiss international lawyer, but also the president of the International Court of Justice at The Hague between 1925 and 28, and had also served as president of the International Committee of the Red Cross between 1928 and 1945, he developed the concept of an international ethic that would transcend the law, meaning go beyond the law. Okay. Many things we push as human rights, we are pushing them into our constitutions, we are pushing them into our laws, it's mainly because we have a shortage of an, an, an international ethic that transcends the law. So Max Huber, in all these various capacities, pushed for an international ethic that would transcend international law, that would stand behind international law, and above international law, and therefore would be an ethic that is not grounded in law. Now, for many international lawyers that you might interact with, it is a matter of principle that neither the law nor morality can assert themselves in the long run without the authority of an ethic which stands behind them and comes from another higher realm which elevates mere custom to morality. So by the time we reduce these international customs into writing, they are already contextually accepted as applicable and relevant as superior to the law, even though sometimes they get reduced into codification. So in respect to international law, which accords the sovereign states very great freedom of movement for politics, the ethic has the task of even criteria for this broad area of political action and setting limits. So for a new world society, We are saying that a world society cannot be created or even enforced with laws, conventions, and ordinances alone. We are also saying commitment to human rights presupposes an awareness of responsibility and obligations for which both the human head and the human heart must be addressed. And we are also saying law has no permanent existence without ethics. So there will be no new world order without a world ethic.
what then could be the criteria in the formulation of a global ethic? The criteria would be careful not just to offer a thin or minimum ethic. All the helpful suggestions from philosophy should of course be taken up. Whether they are inspired more by linguistic analysis as the critical theory from Frankfurt or the concrete form of the global ethics should be formulated in such a way that philosophers too, like agnostics and atheists, can make it their own. Even if they do not share a possible transcendent ground for such a concrete form. Another suggestion as to the criteria would be that a concrete form of the global ethics, of the global ethic, may not offer a thick maximum, neither a thin minimum nor a thick maximum. Of course, such a concrete form should also be relevant to the economic and political levels and support the forces working towards a just economic, social, and environmental order. That's with regard to the criteria, neither thin nor thick, so that everyone can own this suggestion of what the global ethic is. What then could be the content of this global ethic? The Council of the Parliament of the World Religions met for the first time between August 28th and September 4th, 1993, with the participation of 6,500 people from every possible religion and ventured into commissioning and presenting a declaration on a global ethic. This declaration is now the basis for an extensive process of discussion about the content of the global ethic. And while it is not an end in itself, it is certainly a beginning. One of the many hopeful signs for the acceptance of this declaration was the confirmation of the Chicago Declaration by a report of the Interaction Council of former presidents of the state and prime ministers who were led by Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. Now this statement has taken the view that ethics has priority over politics.
to quote the statement says that ethics should precede politics and the law because political action is concerned with values and choice. Ethics, therefore, must inform and inspire our political leadership. So the basis of global ethics is in two basic principles. One, every human being must be treated humanely. Two, what you wish done to yourself, do to others. This Interaction Council working on this declaration also affirmed four irrevocable directives on which all religions agreed. One, commitment to a culture of non-violence and respect for all life. Commitment to a culture of non-violence and respect for all life. Now, that commitment taken seriously would actually mean that all our armories will be closed. It would mean that governments should actually cease to spend zillions of shillings on production of ammunition. Commitment to a culture of non-violence and respect for all life, being the age-old directive, thou shall not kill, or in positive terms, have respect for life. All religions agreed on this as one of the major commitments that would form the content of a global ethic if it shall exist. Two, commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. Commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. So the old age directive, you shall not steal all in positive terms, deal honestly and fairly, can be found in all religious traditions. And at the global level, we can affirm the commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. These situations where Congo must remain at war, all those who are getting minerals therefrom will lose. This situation where the Nigerian Biafra region has to remain in conflict, all the oil drillers will not get it. The situation where Somalia must remain in turmoil, otherwise the sea, the seashore, which they control, would be lost. Okay, so these are related commitments. The third commitment is that it's a commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. A culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness which affirms the age-old directive, thou shall not lie. All in positive terms, speak and act truthfully. Can you imagine if the globe was walking this path, the espionage and the gerrymandering and everything that political discourse comes along with would be at bay. 
Finally, the commitment number four is commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. This would then affirm the age-old directive, thou shall not commit sexual immorality, all in positive terms, respect and love one another. So you then realize that a global ethic stands out there as a possible challenger to the struggle in which we find ourselves in society today. The obligation in particular of truthfulness is so important in a world where swindling and hypocrisy, ideology and demagoguery seem to be reigning. We have politicians and business people who use lies as a means to success. We have a mass media which spreads ideological propaganda instead of accurate reporting. We have scientists and researchers who give themselves over to morally questionable ideological and political programs. We have representatives of religions who dismiss other religions as little value. And the chain goes on and on. So that it becomes necessary that we enforce the obligation to truthfulness. In the great ancient religions, we find a directive that is common to all. You shall not lie or speak and act truthfully. So the global ethic would be calling society to reflect anew on the consequences of this ancient directive. No woman or man, no institution, no state or church or religious community has the right to communicate lies to other humans. This is especially true for those who work for mass media, for the artists, writers, and scientists, for leaders of countries, politicians, and political parties, and for representatives of religions themselves. And by the way, let no one be deceived. There is no global justice without truthfulness and humanness. Young people like you who are in university at this point in time must learn at home and in school to speak and act truthfully. They have the right to information and education to be able to make the decisions that will form their lives. And without an ethical formation, they will hardly be able to distinguish the important from the unimportant. We live in this digital age where we have a flood of information, fake news, corrupted communication, insinuations, ethical standards already built within yourself help you discern when opinions are portrayed as facts when interests are veiled, when tendencies are exaggerated, and when facts are twisted. To be authentically human, in the spirit of our great religious and ethical tradition, it means we have to consider the following. One, we must not confuse freedom with arbitrariness 
all pluralism with indifference to truth. Just because there are many perspectives, therefore there is no truth, no. Just because we are free doesn't mean we do what we want. That's what we mean by we must not confuse freedom with arbitrariness or pluralism with indifference to the truth. Two, we must cultivate truthfulness in all our relationships instead of dishonesty, dissembling, and opportunism. We must cultivate truthfulness in all our relationships instead of dishonesty, dissembling, and opportunism. Three, we must constantly seek truth and incorruptible sincerity. We must constantly seek truth and incorruptible sincerity instead of spreading ideological or partisan half-truths. Finally, we must courageously serve the truth and we must remain constant and trustworthy instead of yielding to opportunistic accommodation to life. So these principles that we've just gone through on the question of truthfulness, on the question of which commitments, are essential to the world ethic can be found in the declaration of the Parliament of World Religions, which in a thoroughly self-critical way shows the best side of the religions. Even though it is true, unfortunately, that religions have another less pleasant side which has to be challenged, of course, if we are to build a world society. So we've been rolling for the last one and a half hours. If you have any questions for me, I would love to take them. Okay. Shall we say that in the event that you don't have any question, let me see the chat room. Okay, then I says they have no question. Now when you see someone has been talking for one and a half hours and there's no question, either he has been very clear or completely unclear. Which of the two? Okay. There being no other question. The class was adjourned to next week. Let's meet then. There will be some reading materials in this section on the feasibility of the global ethic and some materials on wild youth alliance interact with the material and see if you can respond to the question there. So see you next week.